we want to see people embracing, which is public transport and electric cars, and how much is going on to pollution. It's the problem we've got with climate change is that... I don't understand. Angela, we, we've had congestion charge in this city for more than a decade, maybe getting right, yeah. you know, for 20 years, certainly over 10 years. The air quality is actually getting worse because then more cars are now concentrated on just a couple of lanes. Why would we make it even more difficult? It's just going backwards. What we're currently doing isn't having the effect because, like you say, the air pollution, if it's 40,000 premature deaths a year from air pollution, we have to tackle air pollution. Also, we have to tackle climate change, and the biggest source of climate change emissions comes from transport in okay, the UK. So why are we not going forward with the congestion? Why Hey guys, it's Joel and welcome back to the channel and I am extremely excited for today's video because we are back with a gorgeous 2024 Audi R8. This one being the Quattro, which benefits from the full 620 PS from that glorious 5.2 litre V10. Now there's a bit of a difference here because despite most of my brutally honest reviews being with brand new cars and this one being no exception, this is actually a brand new car that you can no longer go and spec because the very last Audi R8 about a month ago at the time of filming this was manufactured. There will be no more R8, which for me, I find a little bit confusing and difficult to get my head round. Now, I wasn't going to liken it to this, but the death of the Queen, for me, that was a really weird situation in which some constant you'd always known was just gone. And for me, it's very similar with this Audi R8 ever since 2005 when it was first launched and featured on Top Gear and all the other motoring shows at the time. Well, it was a thing of beauty and it completely changed the supercar game. It's just always been there. It's always been that sort of dream attainable supercar for me and for many, many petrol heads out there too. And so knowing that this is now going to be no longer is kind of kind of sad it feels like a little bit of a loss and of course it is a big loss because the outgoing r8 as we have here still retains the 5.2 liter v10 flagship engine which produces around 620 ps it's it's glorious it's been around for a long time it's been evolved over the years and it's also found its way into other cars as well lamborghini hurricane for example and no one is disputing that this is one of the greatest engines ever made and will be sorely sorely missed. In fact, it's not just the V10 going in Audi's case, but they, like many other manufacturers, are going to be doing away with the combustion engine altogether. And they have said that potentially the R8 name might come back at some point in time, but it will certainly not be with an engine, certainly not with a V10. It will be an electric version. Although I have a theory on that, which I'll share with you a little bit later on in the video. So take a good hard look at this 24 registration because it's the highest number you'll ever see on one of these R8s. These will never have the 74 registration that comes out in September because as I mentioned, they've stopped making these now. In fact, I'd be really interested to know exactly where this one is in the sequence because this one must be easily in the last 100 R8s ever made. And so I do feel extremely privileged and special to be given the opportunity to experience this car and to run it as my daily driver for the week. In fact, that week has just passed, the car goes back tomorrow, and I've covered some thousand miles in this particular car. But not only that, I've had various other loans and experiences with this platform of R8 prior to this, and I think I've covered around 10,000 miles in these R8s altogether. So with that, I do feel like now is a really good time to bring one of these on 
for a brutally honest review. Not only because it will probably be the last opportunity I get to experience one of these properly, but I feel like I've got a really good idea of what these are all about. And I've picked up on so many things that I think are absolutely wonderful, fantastic, and gonna be missing in Audis of the future. But also there's some issues with this car and it still may apply to people later down the line watching this video, planning on buying one of these cars used. In fact, that might be me one day. I mean, I'll pinch myself the day it happens, but I do very much plan towards owning one of these one day because, well, I absolutely love them. So let's quickly go through the spec sheet of this particular press car uh, so that we know exactly what we're playing with. <laughs> this isn't gonna take long because the spec sheet, well, it's blank. There are literally no options on this thing whatsoever. And then we have on the road, which is a delivery charge, half a tank of fuel, number plates, VAT, road fund license, first registration fee. And the total then of this particular press car is 152,790 pounds. But you will never pay that for one of these because in fact, they are selling brand new ones for about 10 grand under that. And I think as these things become older and miles get put onto them, they will go down in value a little bit. Maybe not to the levels that you can get an early Gen 1 V8 to. I mean, 25, 30 grand gets you into one of them quite comfortably. But I think these things will go right down to 50, 60 grand as the early examples of the facelift or the 2015 onwards generation of R8 have done already. Now, if I may just have a quick chat with you about the engine, because this is not just any ordinary engine. And of course, people have talked to the moon and back about this thing, but what you have to remember is it's actually, it's a, it's a race engine. This first debuted in 2009 in GT3 in the R8 LMS at the time, before it was put into any road cars. And of course it's been shared between Audi and Lamborghini and has evolved quite a lot over the years to what we have now. Now, it's not the maximum amount of output you can get out of this, 620 PS. In fact, it generates more in the Lamborghini Huracan, but it's, it's a race engine and it feels like it as well. I think anyone that's driven one of these cars will tell you it is of course the beating heart. It is all about the engine, but just the way it revs, the way it sounds, the way it goes, and the way you're able to just open up this hatch and look at it. Oh, I mean, it's just one of the best engines ever made. Right, so although I have been banging the drum immediately from the start of this video about the V10 engine being the heart and soul of this car, I do on these Bruce the Honest reviews want to jump inside and really get an idea of what this car is like to live with. Because the reality of it is you're gonna spend a lot of time in this car driving to those nice roads or maybe even using it as your daily driver. And if you're someone who doesn't think you'll ever experience one of these, then I think it's really nice to get an idea of what it's like to live with. And so we're going to look at the infotainment in detail, all the switch gear, buttons, features, etc., etc. Uh, very quickly, I should address it. Actually, you've probably noticed there is a very clumsily placed cushion behind me here. Now that is actually, well, at the first point, I suppose, it's for my back with these seats. I find these seats tremendously uncomfortable. In fact, when this thing got delivered and dropped off last week and I saw that it had the seats in it, uh, I immediately went inside and got a cushion as I always do because I just can't take it more than about half an hour in this car without any sort of lower back support. It really hurts me. So these are the R8 bucket seats. I believe they were an option on the car. So I was a bit surprised to see them because that options list had nothing on them. Normally with no options, it would come with the comfort seats, which are quite adjustable and I quite like those. They're not the best, but they're much better than these in my opinion. So now I don't find these very comfortable at all. However, fellow YouTuber Joe Achilles, I had a conversation with him, I think I recall uh, a little while back about these seats and he personally loves them and finds them great and hates the comfort ones whereas I'm the opposite. So there's an ass for every seat, as they say. Uh, they are not bad in terms of adjustability. You can go up and down electronically with this button here, forwards and back. They're very low to the ground, which is, I guess, the appeal of them. But there's no forward and back recline feature. You can pull a little toggle at the back here and fold the seat forwards, which will give you better access to the limited storage behind, but that's basically it. Now the driving position in itself is fantastic. The wheel is obviously adjustable, quite adjustable actually. It can go quite a long way up and very far down, but also extremely far out, which is where I like to have it. So I like to sit as far back as possible so that essentially I'm closest to the center of the car, I suppose. Getting in and out of the car can be a little bit challenging, not just because of the seats, but you'll have this with all R8s, whatever seats you do have. The doors are just quite long. Uh, when you open the door, you have to open it pretty far 
to get enough room to actually get out. So as I'm finding with parking spaces these days, they seem to be making parking spaces smaller and cars bigger, but you really do ideally need to have no one parked there beside you, or you need to be quite far tucked over so that you can open this enough to get out because open it just on the first notch like that, it's tricky for a podgy person like me to squeeze myself out. And then also getting in can be a little bit of a struggle too with these seats being so low down. And when you do finally manage to get yourself sat in the car, there's not all that much to look at. And in fact, if you go back to 2015 when they brought out the new R8, the interior is basically exactly the same from then. On one hand, I love that because ergonomically, I think this interior works so well. Everything you're gonna possibly need is within easy reach. And in fact, 90% of the stuff you need, you don't even have to take your hands off the wheel to access. However, I think perhaps it's a little bit lazy on Audi's part not to make any major improvements or updates over the almost 10 year production period of this shape of R8. I wonder if Audi have been in somewhat of a flux period, not exactly knowing when they are planning on retiring the R8 and maybe that's why they haven't done any major improvements to the inside. They did obviously do the facelift, which I think brought the exterior appearance bang up to date and actually makes those older ones look a little bit dated now. However, it does all work very nicely in here. As I say, most of the stuff is controlled from the buttons on the steering wheel themselves. But besides that, we have a little pouch for the key here on the left. We do have a knob which you control the volume with, which is great for a passenger because I can do it here on the wheel and otherwise they wouldn't have any choice. So the passenger can also fight over the music. They can skip tracks, turn it up and down here, which is good to have. Then buttons wise, we have heated seat buttons, which I love and the climate control buttons, which are extremely clever. If I switch it on, we can demonstrate. So here we can control the temperature nice and easy. And by the way, these feel so expensive and so well made. Auto, we can have the air conditioning on auto as I normally have it, but if we want to control it manually, we can use this one to adjust how much air we want and this one to adjust where it's going, which is very clever. We have a rear heated screen, we can switch it off here or we can put max ventilation on there. And as I say, heated seat buttons for the passenger and driver with three different settings. Down here below the climate control buttons, we have a couple of USB ports, a 12 volt socket and an AUX input. Uh, the USBs are just standard USB 3s, a little bit of a sign of the lack of updates, I suppose, as it might be nice to have a USB-C there. And also what's quite funny is we do have wireless charging in the R8, but again, they've not changed this since they facelifted the car or updated the car in 2015, because what was it back then, an iPhone 7 maybe? And they were about, yay big whereas this latest iphone 14 max doesn't fit in the wireless charging port so completely redundant basically for new phones if you have the larger size ones it might still fit a standard iphone 14 uh, but that's all there is to speak of down there over here we've got a glove box which is a really good size actually you can get quite a lot in there this big audi wallet that comes with the car doesn't even touch the sides literally and down here, we've got a button for the parking sensors, which you can use to activate or deactivate them. In fact, I do find myself using this fairly frequently to activate the front parking sensors because they seem to be a little bit slow to wake up sometimes. Hazard light, traction control button, and the auto stop start feature. We can switch that off should you wish. But the driving mode I tend to use, which is performance, it has this deactivated anyway. Then we have the grand shift knob, which I love. Again, don't end up really using it because I'm just using the paddles here, but you have got the option to put it in drive, flick it across for manual gearing or down again for sport. And then also, I guess it's kind of useful for the passenger. I don't really find myself using it, but we've got this almost iDrive style control wheel here. And despite there only being what, one, two, three, four, five buttons, there's a lot of functionality and a lot of options you can go through on the car, which we'll look at in a second. So we've got this big wheel, a couple of buttons to the side, uh, menu button, a back button, and some quick toggles here to access the map, the phone, the radio, or your media, which might be your Bluetooth, for example, on your phone. Then uh, parking brake, and that's pretty much it in terms of the switch gear in the center here. In fact, that is everything. Then we've got some cup holders here, which can be flicked up like that will fit a relatively normal size bottle, but certainly not a big two litre one. This is just a smart water, quite a long thin bottle, and that fits fine, but a bigger two litre one like this Buxton or a 1.5, 
there's actually nowhere to put that apart from behind the seat in the storage net, which isn't the greatest, but I find loads of cars these days just have tiny cup holders. Behind the seats, there is a CD player and a shelf for storing things. You can get quite a lot on there actually. And as I just mentioned, there is also a storage net, which is really handy for tucking kind of small things away, like empty flasks or water bottles, for example. And that is it for the cabin. If you go any further back, there's a 5.2 litre V10 engine. Of course, there is a little bit of glass there where you can peer over and see the engine. But from my driving position and even in the rear view mirror, you can't actually physically see the engine. It'd be nice if like the spiders on these coupes, you could also lower that glass and get a bit of that sound whilst the uh, windows are up and everything, but you can't do that on the coupe. In fact, you've never been able to do that. So let's turn our attention now then to the main screen in front of us and look at all the functionalities in here. Now, don't be fooled. There is no big glass fancy screen in the middle of the car here, but there is a lot of functionality packed in to this small screen in front of me. First and foremost, I like that in a car of this much power, 620 PS, all of the information is here. There is nowhere to look in the middle. Therefore, I'm never taking my eyes really off the road. I only have to glance down to here to find out everything I need with the car. Likewise, with the controls for this system, yes, there are some controls in the middle of the car, but 90% of the time you only need to use the controls on the steering wheel. And so even better, you're not having to take your hands off the wheel. So this is the main menu page and we can use the thumb control here on the steering wheel to scroll through all the options. There's various settings we can control, like your standard language, date and time, all of this stuff. And then if we click the left hand button on the steering wheel, it gives us access to further settings, such as with the actual system itself. It's all categorized. And so for example, if we want to mess around with the audio settings on the sound system, we actually just scroll up to sound and in here are the settings for that. Now a quick uh, note on this sound system. Every single R8 I've had prior to this has had the Bang & Olufsen sound system, which was an optional extra, uh, but this one just has a basic 130 watt system, which I have to say is not very good. About on par with the standard 992 911 system. Strongly recommended in that, that you do option the Bose. And if you are seeking out an R8, I would really strongly recommend you go for the Bang & Olufsen sound system. My KN sounds a lot better than this car and the, the music is quite tinny. It sounds like it's coming out of an iPhone. So if you can find one with the Bang & Olufsen, I strongly recommend it. I think it goes up from like five speakers and 130 watts to 13 speakers and 550 watts. So there's a big, big difference there and I strongly recommend you go for that. And then if we go into car, this takes us into all of the information about the car. So as you can see on the left, long-term memory is currently what we have selected, but we can scroll through what we want. So we can go into sports displays, we can scroll through tire pressures, our G meter and our engine data, but also say if I want the tire pressures on this side, and this is how I actually normally drive, but on the right, my additional display, I want to have, let's say my power setting, well then I can. So there I've got tires, power, and my big rev counter in the middle. Now there is actually an entirely different way you can have the display set up. However, I always like to have it this way, but you can go here, click layout, and go to classic layout, which gives you, it'll take a little second to do it, but this gives you the sort of more traditional speedo and rev counter look. There you go, so it looks like that. And then what you'll have then is in the middle, the ability to have whatever you want displayed in the middle. I personally prefer it as we just had it, go back to layout. I prefer it in the sport layout where we have that big central rev counter, speed, and then you can have information either side. I think it's just a better way of getting more stuff on the screen. And when you're pushing on, I certainly like to have my tire temperatures on the left and the power and torque on the right. So there is Apple CarPlay and Android Auto on this car. For Apple CarPlay, you do actually have to plug in the phone. It's not wireless, which again, I feel like could have been updated for this 2024 model. But no, it is uh, still a wired connection, Apple CarPlay. And it does work very well, exactly the same as it would have been in 2015 when they brought this model of R8 out. You've got all your usual functionalities that you'd have on any Apple CarPlay system. I do have a few gripes with it. So as you can see, the Apple CarPlay right now is taking up the central part of the screen. Now, if I want to have my big rev counter back in the middle, which 
for example, when I'm driving quite fast, I want to have that. However, as you can see on the left, to actually see the Apple CarPlay, you have to press the view button and have it in this central configuration, which is fine, but it's not like, say, with the Audi map where it takes up the whole background. It's just sort of rectangular off in the middle and it doesn't look as smart. I feel like they could have integrated it to be full screen or even allowed me to have my Apple CarPlay minimized on the left-hand side so that I can have some data on the right and my big rev counter. Another slight annoyance that I found, and there may be something in the settings either on Apple CarPlay or the car itself that I can change this, but I was in Snowdonia, really rural Snowdonia the other day, and when I got back to the car, I had no internet and I wanted to set the route for Lamberis, but there was no internet. So I couldn't use my phone or the Apple CarPlay. So I went across to the maps on the actual car, never really used these, but I set it in and it worked perfectly. However, every time I had a notification come in through the Apple CarPlay, so a WhatsApp message, it would then revert back to this screen here and I have to wait for the message notification to disappear and then manually go back to the navigation like this, which meant I almost missed a couple of turns. Maybe I can switch that intrusive notification thing off, uh, but I couldn't find a way to do it and it was just slightly annoying. Like I say, I wish there was just a way of integrating the Apple CarPlay properly into this screen so that it could be full screen or at least allow me to have this view like this as well as your fuel consumption displays or your sports displays on the left-hand side or right-hand side. You can actually have your lap time if you're gonna take this car on track. And you can also select uh, the driving mode. So we'll talk a little bit more about these once we go for a drive, but there's a good amount of configurability there. However, I find myself just driving in the performance mode pretty much all the time. And in terms of driver assistance, well, there's pretty much nothing. This car just has cruise control. There's no lane assist there's no adaptive cruise control um, again all stuff you'd probably find in most 2024 cars these days however audi have just kept it very simple to be honest i don't mind ever so much but it, it just indicates a little bit of potential laziness i think where they could have added in a couple of these extra features we have a servicing and checks uh, page here so we can look at our oil level which is quite nice as well as our tire pressures which we have in the uh, other screen and service intervals, which, and this car is actually 19,000 miles or every two years, which I guess is another bonus to buying an Audi. Uh, it's a very, very long service schedule for a car of this ilk. But there is just one more button on the steering wheel that we've not talked about yet, and that is this, the checkered flag, which is the performance mode button. If we press that once, it puts us into performance mode. Then if we twist this knob, we can choose between wet, dry, or snow traction control. As you can see at the moment, I've got wet. But what you can also do is manually turn traction control back on, but still in performance mode, which to be honest with you, is what I 99% of the time are doing on the public roads. There is also an individual mode, which you can configure the engine or gearbox, which essentially is how sharp the throttle response is. Now this one, the suspension, comfort, auto or dynamic. I've been going between comfort and dynamic over and over and over again, and I cannot notice any difference. I know that adaptive suspension was an option at one point with these R8s. There's nothing in the press pack about it. I'm guessing it doesn't have it because I really can't notice any difference. But if it does, then honestly, between comfort and dynamic, I can't notice. Steering uh, comfort dynamic, so it's a little bit firmer. This does have an electronic steering rack, of course, and it is speed sensitive as well. So the faster you go, the sort of firmer it gets. And around town, it's pretty light, even in dynamic. Quattro, uh, it's obviously the all-wheel drive system, and then engine sound, which of course, we've got the V10, so we wanna be making the most of it. That's basically everything on the steering wheel. We've got the nice flappy paddles on the back. Everyone complains about these plasticky feeling, very short and kind of soulless paddles. I don't mind them ever so much. Every now and then you, you miss them because they are quite small. Not the end of the world. They could be nicer. They could be nice and clicky and carbon like a McLaren or even a Ferrari, um, but they're very functional and they're fine. And of course, yeah, we have the indicator stalk, cruise control stalk, automatic wipers, and down here we have automatic lights and a very handy manual control for the lighting on the display in front of me. Again, really good merit there because I hate having to go into a big infotainment screen and finding the brightness adjustment and trying to slide it with my finger here. I've got a proper button to do that, which is extra handy. We have a bonnet release button on the right. 
and mirror controls, which of course are electronic and they fold and we also have heating. Then we've got our electric windows and that's about it. In terms of other storage, I didn't mention this earlier on before we do go for a drive, there are these door bins, but they're pretty useless. You can't get much in there at all. I'll get some shots of the front luggage compartment for you as we drive, but I can tell you it's 115 litres, which leaves quite a lot to be side. You can get a couple of soft bags in there and a few other bits and bobs, but you do have the storage shelf on the back, which you can get another couple of bags on as well. We did take this car to Snowdonia for a weekend, a few days ago, and we had a bag each, plus some walking gear, some extra rucksacks, and we had no problems fitting it all in the car. It was very, very comfortable. So I think for most stuff, you're gonna be okay. If you're planning on touring Europe for three months and bringing all your stuff with you, you might struggle, especially if you've got a passenger but it's all right. A Porsche 911 has 140 litres in the front, so a little bit more, and obviously it does have the rear seats, so it's not quite as practical as that. But Porsche 911 doesn't have a V10 engine in the back. And speaking of that, that's enough chat about the interior. Let's pop the car into performance mode and start the engine up and go for a drive. <laughs> so in the R8 performance quattro then, and you do feel special in this thing. I think the Tango Red paintwork certainly helps. This thing does garner a lot of attention. There's two main things you see actually when people notice the car. It's either one of these, which I'm pretty sure is a happy gesture, or one of these, which I'm not quite sure what that means, but people seem to do that a lot. But to be honest, from where I'm sat, I don't really care what people think because I just feel so, so special. I think those who immediately dismiss an Audi R8 because of the badge, well, they've probably never driven one because this thing is a supercar. Considering most things we'd class today as supercars don't even have naturally aspirated engines, that's already a great big tick in the box of Audi R8. This sounds better than 90% of quote-unquote supercars. And with 620 PS, and an eight and a half thousand RPM red line, it certainly feels like one too. I think at least in terms of this latest Quattro Performance Edition, the R8 is more compromised than people might lead you to believe as well. We talk about the R8 as being the everyday supercar, and yeah, despite the fact I have been using this every day as my daily driver for the past week, if I didn't have this cushion behind my back, then, well, I wouldn't be walking, and there's not really anywhere to put your things. Getting in and out of the car can be a bit of a faff at times. And again, in this paintwork, it doesn't really go under the radar. You do at many times feel like you're in a fishbowl driving this thing. But if you're still not convinced that this is a supercar, put your foot down <laughs> and hear that sound because that is sadly a sound that is no longer. Nought to 62 miles per hour in this Quattro performance is 3.1 seconds, and it will go on to do 205 miles per hour. In fact, I did 205 miles per hour, not in this, but a previous one that I had before. So I can absolutely attest to that fact. Although peak power is at 8,000 RPM and peak torque at 6,000 RPM, it doesn't ever feel labored or lacking at the lower RPMs. And the crazy thing about this Audi R8 is it is so easy to drive. Yes, I've spent quite a lot of time driving these cars now. However, the very first time I did do so, straight away I was confident enough to put my foot down. It's not particularly intimidating. The view you get certainly out the front and sides is very, very good indeed. Out the back, yes, you've got a kind of small window, but you've got an amazing reversing camera. So when you are actually trying to maneuver and head backwards, you can see so much. The sound doesn't really come alive till about 5,000 RPM in this car, which is exciting because you're chasing that the whole time. But when 5,000 RPM in first gear is over 30 miles per hour, it means sometimes at those lower speeds when you want to experience the full sound, you can't. I think if this was my car, I would do a modification of some kind to the exhaust to mean that the valves were fully open at all times. The downshifts I absolutely love in this thing. In fact, I change gear way more than I need to in this thing. It's one of the many pleasures 
of driving this car. This has the seven-speed S-Tronic gearbox. It's very, very good. I find on the upshifts, it's always instantaneous and faultless. Sometimes on the downshifts, it's a little bit slow to respond. And certainly in performance mode, second, first gear, downshifting and upshifting around those lower speeds, it can be very, very lurchy. I think a lot of that is by intention. I mean, I'm in performance mode, but it can catch you a little bit off guard and send your passengers' heads forward at a moment's notice. Then let's talk about the brakes on this thing, which are absolutely fantastic. They are indeed carbon ceramics, and it means you can push and push and push with this car, and they don't ever start to fade or let you down. And it all just feels very easy to control. The throttle response is extremely simple to manage. The brake pedal hasn't got too much bite. It's a very progressive travel on there. You know exactly how much pressure you're going to be getting from the pads. And then I just love the simple fact that there are no distractions in this cabin. There's nothing over here to look at. I've got my speed, my revs in front of me. I've got the sound from behind me and I've got this great big view in front of me of the road. And that's what I truly love about driving these R8s. But what of the handling with this then? Well, I have to admit it's slightly lacking in feel. You kind of know that the car is going to grip, but there's not really any signals coming through the wheel of when you're reaching close to the edge. Truth be told, I find the steering wheel slightly awkward to hold, maybe ever so slightly too big, and the shape of it a little bit strange. The trim as well can only really remind you of a golf ball, which I find a little bit bizarre. I think, again, my car, if I had to make an adaptation, it would probably be an Alcantara lined wheel. I think that would go a long way to help the whole feel of this wheel. It's just not as good as on a Porsche 911, for example, or even something like that Alpine A110. But I suppose that, like the seats, always come down to personal preference. And for some people, they may much prefer a larger wheel like this. I will forgive the wheel though for having access to absolutely everything I need within easy reach. For example, we're in performance mode, basically how I drive this car the entire time. But now I want to quieten things down a little bit. All I have to do is press one button, this checkered flag button here. It goes back into auto mode. I can flick it into drive like that. And there we go. The steering gets a little bit lighter. That throttle response softens off a little bit and that noise has quietened down. And this, and this is where you really can begin to imagine yourself using this relatively comfortably every single day. For me, you would have to ditch these seats and get the comfortable ones. It just makes it more comfortable not only to sit in, but it makes getting in and out twice as easy every single time. Whilst we're all quieting down, let me just talk quickly about fuel economy because you might be surprised as to what I gotta say. Now, Audi quote a combined average of 21.7 miles per gallon with this car, which already sounds pretty good if you ask me from a 5.2 litre V10. However, I have several times during the last week managed to get 30 as an average on relatively long drives. 50 mile drive to my parents' house, which I do fairly frequently. In fact, my KN will struggle to get 23 miles per gallon on that. Yes, that's a big over two ton SUV, but this has a 5.2 litre V10 and I averaged 30.5 miles per gallon on that drive, obviously with a feather foot. In fact, I did do a video a while back when I took an R8 to Germany. I drove all the way back from the Nürburgring to the UK on one tank of fuel and that was something like high 20s as well, over a 400 mile distance. It's very, very efficient, this engine, when you want it to be. One thing I would recommend though, if you're seeking one of these out, is go for one with the optional larger fuel tank. This one's just got a 73 litre tank, which means with that sort of generic average, you're struggling to get around 300 miles on a tank, whereas you can get optioned an extra 10 litres at 83, and the range is closer to 350, which is a little bit more feasible. Even on roads like this, these narrow B roads in Britain, covered in potholes, very greasy today, the car doesn't feel oversized. It's actually quite a small car, this, in terms of length. It's only 4.4, just over 4.4 metres long, which is short by today's standards. It's two metres wide with the wing mirrors out, 
and only 1.2 meters tall, which I love. I love standing next to this car because you just completely arc over the top of it. But it's so easy to place, even though it is relatively wide and very low to the ground, it doesn't catch bumps, it doesn't bottom out or scrape very much. Even those really nasty yellow and black speed bumps you get go over slowly, but it never catches them. It is a totally usable car, this. And as I said earlier, one that I think any Tom, Dick and Harry could get in and drive pretty fast, pretty quickly. That relatively small package makes it quite light as well. 1595 kilograms if it's unladen with no driver. So about 2000 kilograms with me in it. <laughs> but joking aside, it does feel very, very easy to place on the road and not too heavy. Things I find really annoying then with this car, using it all the time. Uh, number one, I did mention it earlier, but my phone just doesn't, there's no really anywhere to put it. It doesn't fit in here. Okay, it will go in there, but it's not actually secured. Otherwise, I could put it on the seat, but that's not ideal if you've got a passenger. There's just not really anywhere sensible to put this large phone. I find the way I sit in this car, occasionally, after a little while, my right knee gets a bit sore, but that's because it's sort of resting against the side of the door here, which although is trimmed in leather, is extremely hard. In fact, it sounds like a wooden door, and so my knee doesn't really have anywhere else to go and does get a bit sore after a while. On the left, it's not as much of an issue because there is actually a soft cushioned pad for you to rest your leg. Potentially, it's just the way that I sit like a weirdo, but it is a little bit painful after a while. I wish that in a car of this value, an option at least to have cooled seats as well as heated seats. I know these are the buckets, but even on the comfort seats, that's not been an option. Along with that, a heated wheel. Yes, it's a supercar, but a heated wheel might be a nice thing to have too. On this particular example, the sound system is pretty poor. Like I said, in fact, woeful might be a better word to describe it. And also we have this kind of nasty material that they've trimmed half the car in. And this one is void of the lovely quilted headliner. Okay, I don't really care about that, but this material is really, really odd and looks like that after a few years, it will start to pull away and lose its shape quite a lot. In fact, it seems to have done so in a few places already. I mentioned this before, but right now, for example, I'm following my sat nav on Google Maps using Apple CarPlay because I need to know where I'm going. I have no idea where I am. However, the point being, I would love to still have my big display showing my tire temperatures, for example, my rev counter and my speed, and then maybe my Apple CarPlay directions on the right. I would just like there to be some adaptability between the screens and some compromise with the Apple CarPlay system too. Okay, so this one is really annoying. When I'm driving along on this screen here, which I like to do as I mentioned, but I need to switch back to Apple CarPlay to see where I'm going, for example, I click left button here and it takes me to the Apple CarPlay system. However, sometimes I get mixed up and I click right instead. And when you do click right, it takes you across to the Bluetooth or USB connection mode and it switches the car out of Apple CarPlay. So if you're listening to a podcast or music, it will go off. And so you have to go back across to Apple CarPlay, go back into your Spotify, going off the maps or whatever it is you're listening to, to find your podcast again and restart it. And I do that so many times you wouldn't believe, despite having spent a lot of time behind the wheel, every now and then I click the wrong button and it takes me about a minute or two minutes to get the sound back that I was listening to before. And just in general, I wish that they'd done a little bit more to update the interior. In fact, from looking at the older models, i.e. from 2015 onwards, it looks like they've removed stuff, if anything. Quite a few of the older models used to have an exhaust button down here, which I think would be quite nice to have, be able to control the sound individually but they've just not really updated anything at all. And it seems that there used to be more options in terms of seating and materials too. There's some older models that are half leather, half Alcantara, for example, and that's certainly not been an option for the last few years. It would be nice if they'd added things like adaptive cruise control as options or different seats or updated this display to address some of the things that I've mentioned. And what it means really is I don't suppose there's any actual point of buying a 2024 or 2023 or even a 2022 shape car. They facelifted it in 2018. So if you want the exterior looks, get a late 2018 car onwards and you can get them from under a hundred thousand pounds now, closer to 90 in fact. And you're essentially getting exactly the same car as I'm sat in today 
at £158,000. I wouldn't say this car is overpriced. In fact, 150 grand sounds like fantastic value for a V10 usable supercar. But I think it's just the fact that there's not really any differentiation between one from 2019 and one from 2024. And the 2019 car is almost half the price. So why would you buy a brand new one? I think those slightly older cars probably sound a little bit better as well because the very early ones would have come before the extra particulate filter had to be added. But at the same time, I think if I was in the position to buy a brand new R8 right now, I probably would, given that they stopped production of this car and at the moment there's no plan that the R8 badge will ever return, I think I'd probably grab a brand new one while I could because it will really be the last chance to ever do so. I did say earlier though I had a bit of a theory on them bringing back the R8 and look I could be completely wrong but call me stupid I don't think the whole EV thing is going to be a permanent solution to the motor vehicle and I just think that potentially in about 10 years time manufacturers that have gone completely EV may need to backtrack they may need to maybe the technology is not going to improve as much as we think it will maybe there will be some discoveries about the real truth of emissions when manufacturing these lithium-ion batteries and potentially we go back to combustion but look at hybrid as a more permanent solution and so my theory may be that let's say in 2035 Audi returned the R8 not as an EV but as a hybrid hypercar I would love to see that maybe it would have a four-cylinder or six-cylinder engine but 900 horsepower something not too dissimilar to what we see now in the new Lamborghini Revelto or Ferrari SF90. Who knows? But I can't see the whole EV thing being a permanent and only solution to our global emissions problem. So I'm going to leave you all to ponder on that final thought and you can enjoy with me now the glorious sound of the 5.2 litre V10, which we have now said a permanent goodbye to with Audi. I'm going to enjoy this last few hours I have with this car and thank you all so much for watching this video and I'll see you in the next one. Extra clip for those of you that are still watching, I'm just sat in the car filming some B-roll, all of those shots that you see over the top of the bits where I'm talking. And I was just noticing that the doors are actually completely different. So on the passenger side, you can see the speaker there is in the silver leather. And on my side, it's black, but also the shape of the door is completely different to the passenger side. I guess because I have my controls for the wing mirrors and button for the boot release, window switches etc here you can see the window switches are in a different space on the passenger side but I just can't think I've ever seen that really where the passenger door is a completely different design to the driver's door anyway thank you all so much for watching and I thought I'd just share that random thing that I just spotted with you mm -hmm.